covenantal agreements in the Old Testament culture were very specific. Life and death pacts between individuals, clans, or nations. In most cases, a superior in might was requiring the treaty of sorts to subjugate or subordinate. Also, the dominant or conquering party established all the terms and the conditions of the contract, usually harsh or at least not mutually beneficial. And the weaker party, well, they were forced to acquiesce or else. Well, that's not at all what's going on in Genesis this morning. God, the greater of the two parties, is covenanting with Abram. But it's God who's offering all the concessions. God will protect, provide, and proliferate the future nation. They need only love and be in relationship with God for the blessing to continue. Their end of the bargain was pretty sweet. And they were the lesser of the two parties. Now, this was unheard of in Old Testament times. Polytheistic gods, they did not interact with humans at their level. They were precocious, capricious. They were indifferent about humans. Their mood or opinion of mere mortals was inconsistent and could turn for the worst without provocation as if people were just invaluable objects existing for their toying. This revolutionary posture of God with Abram differentiates God from any other religion or any other deity of that time. Here's a God that not only cares for mankind's well-being, but will carry the load to ensure that it is so. Now this is big. And a name change signified it. A new identity. Not only that, Think of the impact on Abraham and his descendants. They were chosen. They were set aside as the only race of people on earth with a relationship like that. And the ultimate goal wasn't exclusive, exclusively Hebrew. The whole world was to be blessed through them, a conduit of God's grace. God and God's infinite love was sculpting a redemptive plan for all people and for all time. Well, there's a lot going on there. Now, this gives us crucial insight to Paul's railing in Romans this morning. He sounds like a crazy man. Paul appears to contradict what Genesis had established Remember, Abraham did father a great nation and their covenantal chosenness was affirmed and reinforced through his children and his grandchildren. Later, Moses was chosen to emancipate them from Egyptian bondage, but also to profit them with another divine gift, their law, Torah. It was their way to truth and salvation. God dictated the Ten Commandments to Moses, and from their expansion was born the Jewish Levitical Code, which was basically, basically their religious set of rules for everything, every aspect of their living. Remember, there was no separation of church and state in the Old Testament. To be Hebrew was Jewish, to be Jewish was Hebrew. From Torah, the Old Testament concept of righteousness is born now, it's very straightforward, okay? Obey the law, and you will be right. And if you're right, you will be blessed. That's the Old Testament view of righteousness. Unfortunately, the converse was true also. Disobey the law, and note here, ignorance of that law is no defense. You will disobey the law, and then you're wicked, and you get punished. It was like a covenantal contract that held God liable to man if they followed the rules. Now again, no other gods of that time would be inclined to give up their preferential, preferred prerogative to be insensitive to mankind's plight. 
much less to be contractually obligated based on terms that favored mortals. No way. And once again, it was God who did all the heavy lifting. Only God could hold man and God accountable. Well, the Jewish history is one remarkably, as good as they had it, of their inability to hold up their end of the deal. A reciprocating cycle of them falling out of God's favor just to be punished. And then they would repent and return, only to fall away again. That's the crux of the Old Testament narrative. They became lazy, entitled, ethnically arrogant. It kind of sounds like the United States of America. They forgot their name. They forgot their name. So Paul is suggesting, as N.T. Wright describes in keeping with this analogy of the law, that God stopped the cycle once and for all with the ultimate dream team defense strategy. The Jewish Jesus, who metaphorically as legal counsel offers the final vindication for the Jews and the ideal bridge for everyone else in fulfilling the law, completing all the prophecy. You see, read at a surface level, it sounds like Paul is proposing civil disobedience with all this never mind the law stuff. It sounds like a mercenary opinion or view of civic order. But there's so much more going on than that. Paul is saying that there is a new way to righteousness, a new chosen people. They will be Jesus followers, not rule keepers. It all comes full circle with Jesus, who we find in Mark rebuking Peter for not getting it. Peter, who was Torah-bound and fundamentally narrowly focused on a traditional interpretation of messianic prophecy, well, he's likened to Satan and called out in front of his peers. He must have been embarrassed and confused. Why is this so significant? Well, up until just a few verses prior to to today's gospel lection, Paul had been called Cephas. He had been given a new name. That sound familiar? Upon this rock, Jesus said, I will build my kingdom. Peter had just confessed that Jesus was Messiah and that type of confession would be the basis of a faith that would construct a new chosen nation. Peter was obviously still processing that meaning when he stuck his foot in his mouth with Jesus. Generations of conditioning would need to be undone, but just as with Abraham, the name change meant something. It was a milestone. It was a rite of passage into spiritual reality. It was identity that would require self-denial and even suffering. Christ went as far as mentioning the most grotesque form of punishment of their day for lawbreakers. the one that would soon be employed by Jewish leaders via Roman implementation, crucifixion. You see, we have the benefit of knowing the rest of the story. The audience that day did not know Jesus was going to die on the cross. It would be a new covenant. And again, God was literally shouldering the the weight across his shoulders in the form of a cross. A blood oath made by his own blood shed for us. He didn't break the law. He fulfilled it. 
vindicating us all as if it was our day in court. Confessing this Christ as your Lord continues to change people even today. Any who are willing to be dedicated to that extent, giving our all like Peter and Abraham, both recipients of name changes. All are given covenantal relationship with God, a new chosen people with a new name. Beloved, dear ones, Lent provides us with an opportunity to remember our name. So what's in a name? Everything. Amen.